well met, and welcome to the Hearthstone Championship Tour America's Winter Preliminary. I'm Robert Worthen Wing, joined on the desk by Cora Songbird Georgiou, and of course, Brian Kibler. Over the course of this weekend, we'll be highlighting the journeys of 117 players as they battle for eight spots at the America's Winter Championship taking place next month. Akora, you remember at Vic Vicious Syndicate Gaming, which has actually fielded more players for this event than any other Hearthstone team. How exciting is this for you? It's so exciting, especially for these guys who've worked so hard and maybe are more semi-professional players, not the most known names, but are definitely hoping that this can be really a breakout event for them. Right. And Brian, you actually qualified to play in the America's Winter <laughs> Preliminary, but here you are on the desk with us. I have to know. How much of this was motivated out of a desire to hang out with me? <laughs> well, I, I actually had agreed to do commentary for this before I sort of accidentally got top 25 legend in January, and I knew you'd miss me, so here I am. See, the moral of the story is no matter how much someone doesn't return your text, that doesn't mean they dislike <laughs> you. But enough about my personal life. Uh, if you did not get a chance to watch the Europe Winter Preliminary last weekend, you might not necessarily know how the Hearthstone Championship Tour works. And the short version is, it's all the cool stuff leading up to the Hearthstone World Championship taking place later this year. It includes ranked seasons, community cups, majors, seasonal preliminaries, and now seasonal championships. So, Cora, uh, last year, obviously, you were one of those players on the grind. You're really trying to make it to the Hearthstone World Championship. Fell a little bit short, but uh, what does it mean to a player like you to have that opportunity to, to kind of be more involved with Hearthstone Esports leading up to the World Championship as opposed to just have to do the World Championship? Yeah, I didn't quite make it, but for the guys who, you know, are competing, they are not the most known players, but definitely the Hearthstone Championship Tour is all about bringing the community together and giving those lesser known players a chance to really make it big and become like the superstars, even though they may not have gotten the invites last year, they might not have had as much of an opportunity to play. Now is really their chance, so I think it's really an exciting and a much better format for the year. Right, and this weekend will feature some of the top Hearthstone Championship Tour point earners for the winter season, as well as some local tavern heroes, and they'll be throwing down with everything they have to try to secure one of those top eight spots at the America's Winter Championship taking place from March 11th through March 13th. And, you know, it, it's not just about winning the share of the prize pool. There is a $100,000 prize pool, obviously, for each of these seasonal championships, but more importantly, perhaps, the person who wins, just that's it for them. They secure their spot to the Hearthstone World Championship later this year. And, you know, Brian, you are obviously uh, very well known as a card game competitor all throughout your career. What does it mean to just be able to secure your spot to the World Championship in March? Uh, it's relaxing. <laughs> you know, while everyone else is uh, sort of struggling to you know, earn their spot throughout the year, you can focus whether on uh, whether on competition, you know, just playing in some of the larger uh, events, not necessarily worrying about points, but just trying to, you know, get an opportunity to win there uh, or just kind of relax, you know, focus on streaming, maybe maybe play some Overwatch, who knows? <laughs> I was say, I've been playing a ton of that lately. Uh, Cora. <laughs> I am not quite as lucky. I haven't gotten a beta key. I don't know if you can do something about that. Maybe um, I would like to play. Just I'd like to open some skins and know what the hype is about, but I'm not quite so lucky. Uh, I might not be able to do anything about it, but let's go check in with a man who might be able to help you over in the host area. It's Dan, straight out of the Curse Trials. Well, unfortunately, guys, I'm no good at Overwatch either, but uh, I do know a thing about Hearthstone too, and I do know that this event promises to be one of the most exciting yet for the Hearthstone Championship Tour. In fact, in the entire history, the America's region has been one of the most exciting because we get to see a lot of the old established franchise players versus some of the up and coming ones that have been hyped for a long time. But let's go ahead and explain how the format's going to work for anybody who's tuning in for the championships for the first time. I know some people last week, I was reading through some of the comments, and it was the first time they ever watched Hearthstone being played at a competitive level. So it's really awesome to see even new viewers joining us. The format that we'll be playing this weekend, once again, will be a Conquest best of five. So you have to win three games once per every class that you bring. However, you're bringing four decks throughout the entire tournament. You can't change any of the decks throughout the process of it. And before each series begins, you can ban one class from your opponent. You hear the classes, you choose one, take it away, and then you play your best to five. If you're confused, don't worry. We will explain it all throughout the broadcast with our casters and keep reminding you throughout the entire process. Also, to keep checking in with the Firesides, I'll be here all weekend long talking through some of the winners as well as the organizers to see how everybody is doing. Here's a quick glimpse of a pre-recorded segment. We made them wave in the air for about 15 to 30 seconds uh, just to show hi and check in with them throughout all locations from New York to Los Angeles to upwards to Canada, all the way down 
down to all the regions in Latin America. We're really excited to see these people be able to compete. We have 117 players. Promises to be really exciting. So make sure to stay engaged in the conversation. Let us know. Tweet at Play Hearthstone or go to Facebook.com slash Hearthstone. We're going to be featuring some of these social media on the broadcast by hashtagging HCT. So if you're enjoying the games, show us a picture of how you're watching or tell us your favorite moments. It can be featured right here on the stream live for everybody to watch. So make sure, again, hashtag HCT as we get ready to get underway with the America's Championship for the Hearthstone Championship Tour. Let's hand over to Rob and the crew and see what's up next. Thanks, Dan. And kind of piggybacking on what he said, this is the time where you can make your predictions on who's actually going to win for the weekend, and you can be right. If you make it tomorrow, obviously, you know, we're already at that top 16, so it's a, it's a lot less cool. So tweet us, uh, use hashtag HCT, tweet play Hearthstone, and let us know who you have making it to the top eight. But yeah, we saw, obviously, last weekend, the Europe Winter Preliminary, a little bit of a different story than I think a lot of us had expected. You know, we, we kind of saw the big names. We saw Ties, we saw the world champion Ozkaka, we saw names like Zixo, really expecting them to just pull through and, and just smash through a lot of these lesser-known players, and it really wasn't the case. We saw uh, some great performances from maybe some more underdog players that, that we didn't necessarily know. Cora, uh, what was that like watching? Did you, did you kind of expect those upsets? It was really exciting for me. Now, I'm clearly more involved with the lesser known players in uh, the North American region. But uh, to see all those lesser known players like Tars, Jombre with that Egg Druid, um, all these exciting players that must have been so just, it must have been so awesome for them to know that they knocked out some of these really amazing, huge Hearthstone players. Now, yeah, Brian, obviously we casted some of these matches together, you know. What, uh, what would you say is your favorite thing about the Europe Winter Preliminary last weekend? I, I think the, the best thing coming out of it was really sort of showcasing uh, what the Hearthstone Championship Tour means, which is really an opportunity for a lot of players who may not have been in the spotlight before to really have their chance on the big stage. Uh, we saw a couple of, well, well not necessarily established teams, uh, uh, playtest groups. You know, we saw Diggin and Bunnyhopper come through, and both of them managed to make it all the way to the top eight. Uh, with their aggressive Paladin deck, while Secret Paladin was really what everyone else was playing. Right, and while we necessarily didn't see any of these big marquee player names, we did see players like Nyman, who's well-known amongst pro players, very well-respected, and we saw Tars, who actually won DreamHack France, and so these uh, were players who, you know, again, not necessarily super well-known or, or on big teams, but, you know, top eight for the Europe Winter Championship, we have Dr. Hippie, Pokervok, Nick Slay, Diggin, Cereza, Tars, Nyman, and Bunny Hopper. And, you know, over the course of this weekend, we're going to figure out who's going to be making it from the Americas region to the Americas Winter Championship. So, uh, you guys have any favorites? Obviously, Cora, I know you're a little bit biased being from Vicious Syndicate Gaming, but anyone you're really rooting for? Yeah, I mean, uh, Racy591 has a lot of experience with, you know, former trading card games, just a really awesome community cup player. Um, Demigod, also from Vicious Syndicate, but then we've got some huge names like Strife Crow. Um, we've got Fibonacci, just huge, very well-known players. So I think it's going to be anyone's game. Yep, Brian, anyone you're uh, you're kind of pulling for here? Uh, I'm a big fan of VLPS. Uh, I got to know him a little bit at the America's Championship, and I tune into his stream every now and then. And uh, he's a player who I think uh, is, you know, is, is really sharp and you know thinks about the game in a really great way. And uh, I, I expect big things from him. Right, and you know, you yourself mentioned the the kind of benefit you get from being involved in a playtest group, kind of making sure that you're staying up on the meta, you're not just falling behind. Because there's this idea when you play Hearthstone that you just reach this threshold where you're just you're the best. You know, you can't possibly learn anymore. And we've seen, you know, a lot of these uh, smaller teams are, are kind of hungrier, right? And they they want it more. They're playtesting. They're they're getting to know all these kind of different decks as they come out and, and as they first appear. And you know, we've been talking over the weekend about a warrior deck that just you know curves out at six mana. It just has like all these different things. And you know, if you didn't recognize it in tournament, you might you know possibly think it's something like Control Warrior. And, uh, you know, Cora, how much benefit do you see in these groups kind of getting together and playtesting? I think there's so much benefit, and especially the smaller teams like Vicious Syndicate, like uh, Hearthlytics, like Splice. Really, the benefit is that they can come together, they can bounce ideas off each other, they can really work out the meta and work out what the tournament meta is going to be like. And I think that is a huge benefit, especially to a tournament like this. Right, and Brian, obviously some of the some of the favorite decks for this have to be, you know, kind of the, the popular ladder decks, which are, you know, Secret Paladin, Mid-Age Druid, Aggro Shaman has really found a home for itself, you know, post-League of Explorers, but, you know, are you are you kind of expecting to see any decks aside from maybe, I know you dislike Freeze Mage, but <laughs> any other decks you're expecting to see kind of uh, be prevalent for this weekend? Uh, I mean, I, I think that, that the decks we'll see the most are probably things like uh, Mid-Range Druid, like Secret Paladin. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot more uh, aggressive Warlock. We saw a lot of that last weekend as well. Right, and that's uh, kind of was an interesting point to me about that whole weekend is, you know, Warlock is a classic. We played in so many different ways, especially since League of Explorers, but looks like we're actually ready for first match of the day, and it's going to be Fibonacci versus Ethan. And, you know, Cora, you brought up Fibonacci. Mm -hmm. This this guy is kind of like a folk hero on the ladder, right? He's, he's one of these players always playing Control Warrior, always playing these more control-oriented decks. We saw 
uh, obviously some community feature on him. Well, I, I actually see, we, we see the respect from Athan. Fibonacci is known specifically as a control <laughs> warrior player. He's he's made number one legend, I think, three seasons playing almost exclusively control warrior. And here, Athan decides to go ahead and ban Fibonacci's warrior right off the bat. And I'm pretty sure Athan now, he was one of those players who was a tavern hero, right? Mm -hmm. He made it through uh, by winning at a local fireside gathering. He's from South America. And, mm -hmm. you know, Fibonacci, one of these players who might not necessarily be kind of the, the most popularized just based on, like, personality and social media presence, but this has got to be a daunting task for him to come in first round, have to play against someone who, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, is probably one of the best in the game. Cora, you know, what, what do you think it would be like playing against a, a player with kind of that much of a legacy? For Athen, uh, who I'm assuming is also a, a very accomplished ladder player, I would be intimidated. Fibonacci is somebody that you see at the top of Legend every single season, and he is maybe not the most well-known tournament competitor, but definitely very respected as far as ladder, tourna ladder competitive play. So uh, for him, I think it would be intimidating. For, for Fibonacci, definitely just a chance to really show that he can make a dent in the tournament scene. Right. Yeah, for, for top like legend ladder players, Fibonacci is, is almost mythical. Uh, for, for a long time, he, he didn't really stream. He didn't really have all that much sort of social media presence or anything like that. But he just consistently was just at the top of legend every single season. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see him in a tournament setting now. Right, and we saw, as you brought up, that Warrior ban. Obviously, a respect ban. If you don't know much about Fibonacci, you know that you want to ban Warrior. <laughs> uh, this is a guy who, that is his class. That is absolutely his jam, so you know all about it. But, you know, Kit Kats kind of suffered for this as well back in the day. Kit Kats mm -hmm. was, I think, prior to Fibonacci, kind of known as, like, the Warrior God in, in certain circles because you played a lot of Control Warrior. So when you're coming into these, you know, Brian, you've kind of been known for playing these Dragon decks all throughout your career. Do you feel like it's kind of something where going into a tournament, you have to optimize your lineup to expect that ban? I, I mean, I think in a lot of cases, players who are particularly well known for a certain class may actually be able to build their lineups in, in a way that you know if they think their opponent's going to ban that class from them they can even potentially exploit that and it's like okay well if i think that they're going to ban my warrior that allows me to play these other powerful strategies that you know they may not necessarily be ready for uh, i would expect fibonacci to play a pretty control heavy lineup in general like i would expect for instance uh, that to be control warrior probably some sort of control warlock probably freeze mage along with, with that uh, that Druid. So I don't know necessarily how much of a sort of lineup advantage he can get from his opponent banning his warrior, uh, but we'll see. Right, and Ethan obviously uh, banned out, or had banned out his Druid, which, mm -hmm. again, as Fibonacci being a warrior player, you may think to yourself, like, oh, this is one of those situations where Fibonacci expects to play his warrior, he doesn't want to run into Druid, but Druid is one of those classes that feels great to ban. It is a class that is unpredictable to deal with, it, it, capable of these huge burst damage combos, and in general, I think if you don't want to see Druid, it's perfectly fine to ban it. Korra, if you were going into this tournament, what are the classes you would have looked at banning? Uh, my own personal style, I hate playing against Freeze Mage. So I, I just just the threat of a Freeze Mage, I'm like, it's, let's not deal with that. Um, but the Druid, definitely, it's something that most players will bring because they can assume that it is so consistent, they will get a win with it. So just to get that off the table and force them to play the other decks, which may not be quite as consistent, must feel pretty good for Fibonacci. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the Druid ban also suggests that the, the uh, Mage from Fibonacci, perhaps likely a, uh, a Freeze Mage, uh, if he's playing Tempo Mage, he wants to play against Druid. That's one of the, ma the matchups where you, the, the reasons you right. play Tempo Mage. So uh, similarly, uh, I, I would not be surprised to see that that uh, the Warlock deck be a Control Warlock. Because again, if you're playing Zoo, you want to play against Druid. So you can see a little bit of information about what's likely structurally the components of a player's lineup right. based on what they choose to ban. Yeah, we saw, so obviously, you know, last year, uh, I believe it was the opening week of BlizzCon, Life Coach comes over, and, and the meta was kind of set a certain way where mm -hmm. it favored certain decks, but, you know, we actually saw Life Coach stuck to his guns. He brought these control decks, he brought Control Warrior, he brought Handlock. Decks that were thought of as being a little bit weaker, maybe, in the meta, but, you know, he went with it, and, and that was what he was determined to do. And, yeah, I kind of wonder if we're going to see a little bit of this from Fibonacci. Like, Fibonacci doesn't seem like a player from what we've seen in the, the round of 40 North American Qualifier Tournament last year who's necessarily willing to super mix it up. Like, he wants to play certain decks here like he really wants to play a certain style and you know I, there might be I think an inherent weakness to this but we're gonna find out firsthand and Fibonacci opening up with that warlock Ethan opening up with warrior and uh, can't necessarily tell right from the get-go if this warrior is patron or control but uh, Fibonacci appears to be playing some form of reno lock uh, could be could just be sort of a, a, a demon handlock uh, you know the, the Void Caller is actually a card that you often don't see in the Reno decks because they don't necessarily have that many demons. Uh, but Aethon here, uh, yeah, we, he's just got a bunch of good <laughs> Warrior cards, so he could be either Control or, uh, or Patron at this point. Um, yeah, and either the Patron or the Control against if this is a Demon Hand Lock versus if it is a Reno Lock. The Control Warrior does have a bit of a hard time depending on whether it's a combo Reno Lock or more the Jaraxxus variant. 
right? And we see the uh, Twilight Drake pop up in Fibonacci's hand. And to me, that's usually a pretty dead giveaway of something like Reno Lock because it's one of those cards that ends up there, you know, uh, one copy of it. It's a good four slot card, plays the advantage of having a bunch of cards. Although, uh, you know, we've seen that's been a staple of hand lock for, for how long now? Yeah, I mean, uh, the original sort of hand lock style decks were built around the four drop slot at uh, Twilight Drake as Mountain Giant. And we see a Faceless Manipulator, so that usually is more indicative of the combo burst kill. But similarly, that's that's sort of an odd card to have in the same deck as that as that Voidwalker as well, or Voidcaller as well. And speaking of odd cards now, Sylvanas Windrunner in the Warrior deck, that has to be the giveaway that this is Control, yes. as opposed to some other variant of this deck. And Sylvanas is a card which uh, I think for a few sets now has kind of fallen back a little bit in terms of popularity, seen as being a little bit too slow for some of the latter metas, but Sylvanas is an incredibly powerful card. Obviously, once she falls, has the potential to steal a creature if there's something on the board, so uh, I really like seeing Sylvanas in this, and we're gonna see the XQ come out really quickly, because that Twilight Drake is otherwise super difficult for Warrior to remove. Yeah, I really love the Sylvanas, especially against a control Warlock like this. Uh, we do see the shield the shield block in Athan's hand, or the shield slam, excuse me, and if you can build up enough armor to combo that with the Sylvanas, you can really control what you take off of Fibonacci's board, which is usually going to be a larger minion. Right. Uh, we see the Void Caller come down for Fibonacci here, and it looks like he's not going to choose to play the uh, the Zombie Chow as well. Yeah, he's been holding on to that now for a few turns, and I, I kind of wonder if it's something, you know, against some aggro decks, there's certainly merit to holding on to that Zombie Chow, using it with something like Shadow Flame to clear off a bunch of minions, but uh, Brian, why do you think he might possibly be holding on to that? Uh, there's, I mean, there's a number of reasons. One, he could just simply think that his opponent has a relatively easy kill on it. No uh, I mean, he obviously does have the War Axe down now. Uh, the one thing that I actually think is pretty strategically interesting here is that Fibonacci just played that Void, uh, the Void Walker, or <laughs> I always mess these up, Void Caller. <laughs> They're so similar. Uh, without an additional demon in hand, but he actually just drew a second copy of Void Caller. So that's interesting. It, it would suggest that he's most likely not a Reno deck, unless that's the only two of. Usually when you're playing with Reno Jackson, you so may play a one or maybe two two ofs, unless you're a deck that can draw your entire deck, essentially like Freeze Mage. But uh, maybe this is actually more sort of traditional style Demon Lock deck. Yeah, with maybe just a Faceless Manipulator tech. We sort of have to speculate, you know, what demons could he be playing? Could there be a Doom Guard, possibly Jaraxxus? Um, some people even tech in a Dread Infernal, so it's all kind of an up in the air at this point. But that Void Caller was definitely a lucky draw. Right, and I want to point that out too, because when you're playing against Void Caller, especially on Ladder, it's one of those things where that minion comes down on, on turn four, you just kind of stare at it. Like, you're taking quick turns, and you suddenly just start staring at it, you're like, all right, Malganus, you in there? Like, what happens if I break this? And a lot of times, what I'm playing is that's that's actually the, the determining point where I'm like, now we're on the face plan. I don't want to deal with Void Caller. I don't want to get that huge tempo swing from a Doom Guard from a Malganus coming down. Well, there's a couple of, of interesting things about the Void Caller, too, because if, if you let it sit in play, your opponent is more likely to draw into demons, and in fact, more likely to draw into more powerful demons in many cases. So it's kind of a, a risky scenario to leave it in play. It's a risky scenario to kill it. Uh, we actually saw two of the more obnoxious minions to deal with there with the Sylvanas as well, but Fibonacci had the owl to just silence that and take it out of the equation. Yeah, he dealt with that pretty easily. It's sort of like the old Wild West showdown. Do I kill it? Do I leave it? What's more beneficial to me? And you can never really know. We do see the Dark Peddler come down. Mortal Coil, Reliquary Seeker, and Grimscale Oracle. None of them too useful in this situation. The Coil is pretty good. I mean, even if it's not great right now, it's probably the highest overall value card. Yeah, he's actually just going to choose to go ahead and Coil this here. Uh, he could have chosen to play the... Uh, Defender of Argus to actually pump his minion to kill that immediately, but instead chose to get the card draw off the Mortal Coil to sort of accelerate his draw. And there we see the Chow finally come down. Uh, we actually see a second Defender of Argus uh, right. drawn by Fibonacci as well. So I, I think that at this point we've pretty much pretty much confirmed there's this likely not a Reno Jackson in this mm -hmm. deck. Right. And this is one of those times where playing Warlock in this meta. Like I said, you can just do so many things. Uh, we see Fibonacci doing something that seems a little bit off the off the range here of what we traditionally see. We've seen two Dark Bombs, we've seen two Defenders of Argus, and uh, very curious to see, it seems likely, it seems fairly reasonable that we could see something like Leroy Power Overwhelming, Emperor Thoris, and at least that huge burst damage combo. Uh, but, you know, we don't necessarily know. Faceless Manipulator and Control matchups can just be very good on its own. Especially against Control Warrior. We do see the Grom in hand. We see the Ysera. That is such great value, especially with the Faceless Manipulator. Uh, fortunately for Aethan, he, has gonna, he is going to have a pretty easy way to remove it if he can just build up a little bit more armor. 
right? And these matches tend to be, you know, when, as opposed to seeing aggro matches, which are all about making, you know, these quick decisions normally, like how am I going to burst down my opponent? These matches right here tend to be very much chess matches because if you're Fibonacci and you are operating on this plan that you're going to use this big combo to win, you still need the warrior to be, uh, what is it? I believe the combo is 20 damage. So you still need to do the work to get them within range to kill them with a combo. And warrior is perfectly suited to just keep generating uh, armor there. The biggest problem for the Warrior player is actually just the Warlock hero power. Life Tap allows the Warlock player to just continue to generate resources as the game progresses. And we see Fibonacci has pretty much a full hand while a Aethon's resources keep dwindling down as he's using those removal effects. Uh, and eventually, if Fibonacci just keeps effectively drawing two cards a turn, he'll just overwhelm Athen's resources unless he is able to get something like Ysera Awakens off of Ysera. Yeah, Ethan has been steadily removing Fibonacci's cards up to this point, but if he is able to build up a big enough board and we don't see something like a brawl come into Ethan's hand, it's going to be very hard for him to deal with all of the cards that Fibonacci can play in the coming turns. Right, you bring a brawl, that's kind of that equalizer card ever since, you know, the, the beginning days of Hearthstone. <laughs> that was how you, as a control warrior, you beat the, the handlock. You made them play overly greedy, you made them play like two or three giants on turn, and then brawl was the equalizer, but, you know, Ethan doesn't have it, and uh, Brian, as you pointed out, Fibonacci's hand just better and better all the time. You know, it's not necessarily that he has a bunch of threats, but he's not really under much threat either. Like, he's at 17 health, and yes, Grom could come out and do 12 damage, but there's no weapon equipped, so you know exactly how much damage Aethan can possibly do, with the exception of an errant inner rage appearing. Mm -hmm. Here, Fibonacci choosing to Mortal Coil prior to attacking. Ooh, that brings him down to 14. It's actually starting to get kind of dangerous territory uh, against a potential Grom. He does have the big game hunter in hand to kill off the Dr. Boom and the heal bot to heal up for eight. But if Aethan is able to get something like a Ysera Awakens out of Ysera, even a Nightmare on any minion, then this could swing in Aethan's favor very quickly. I'm a little curious by Fibonacci's decision uh, there. He, I, I guess he wants to keep the big game hunter alive, but it doesn't necessarily value his life total all that highly. Um, he also just chose not to attack with his boom bots prior to using the mortal coil. So I, I imagine he was possibly giving himself the opportunity to not play the second copy of Mortal Coil there uh, and maybe attack with one of the boom bots, but then chose not to. So it's an interesting, interesting sequence of decisions from him. Yeah, what do you make of uh, Fibonacci's plan so far, Cora? Do you, do you like what you're seeing from this uh, this handlock line of play, or do you think it should be a little bit more aggressive? I like it so far. I think it's very calculated. Um, he knows that he's always in risk of Grom uh, with the Cruel Taskmaster, so he needs to keep himself above 12, and he is he is safe at this point. He does have the second Defender of Argus. This is where it gets really scary, though, because your opponent just played Ysera, and there are multiple cards from Ysera, uh, the, the scariest of which being Ysera Awakens, uh, which can really change the math on what your opponent's burst damage potential is. You can be hiding behind several times. You can be hiding behind, hey, seven, five health tons, and suddenly you're dead. <laughs> because Ysera wakes up and is not happy. Oh, not yeah, I was going to say, Brian, you probably have a lot of experience on this. Waking up dragons is a very <laughs> dangerous pastime in all of my World of Warcraft adventures. That was never something <laughs> I wanted to do. Now, for Aethan, the good news here is no Siphon Soul. That is what you are afraid of when you play down something like Ysera, is a Siphon Soul coming down. They just keep doing things. It's not a great place. But uh, Fibonacci has the tools to deal with this uh, Ysera. Admittedly, kind of a premium, but uh, goes ahead, just copies it. He's like, I need a Ysera too. This was a great decision. I'm going to copy it. And then heals up, so Fibonacci now suddenly in a really good spot. Ooh. He gets you a Sarah oh, So wow. yeah, this is this is an interesting spot because Fibonacci actually is now the one with a ton of burst potential in his hand. Right. Between that, Ysera awakens the uh, Doomguard Dark Bomb. I, I think he actually may be able to threaten lethal next turn. He's got 13 bursts from hand. And, uh, the Sludge Belcher is going to come down, going to be able to prevent at least seven damage, but this is getting really close. Sludge Belcher, of course, uh, otherwise known as uh, his old name, which is no fun allowed. Like, you're <laughs> you're trying to get there. Sludge Belcher is like, nah, why don't you hang out with me? But That's so close here. Fibonacci, if it weren't for that Sludge Belcher, would just be able to win the game. Uh, but now, there, you know, that Sludge Belcher getting in the way really changes things because uh, the, the Ysera Awakens can't actually kill Ysera. That's an important point. Won't kill your opponent's Ysera as well. Uh, so now Fibonacci's in a little bit of an awkward spot trying to maneuver from, it, from this position. Right, and you talked about, Brian, the fact that Ysera can give you one of five different cards. We see two Emerald Drakes in Aethan's hand, and, you know, Emerald Drake is honestly usually a pretty good middle-of-the-road pickup, but in this situation, Aethan's kind of on the back foot and just needs to stabilize before he can start playing his own threat, so we did see that Sludge Belcher. We saw that armor up, and, uh, you know, Fibonacci kind of the winner in that he got that Ysera Awakens, which uh, allows him to have kind of that X factor in terms of pushing damage. Yeah, the Twilight Drake, or the uh, Emerald Drake, excuse me, really useful normally, great value, but right here, 
just, oh, that is exactly what he needed. Power overwhelming is going to be a huge pickup for him, and uh, Fibonacci sitting on all these really dangerous tools, and, you know, we saw two Void Collars, and we see all the demons he has now. Deathbite's a really big draw for Aethon here because it means that that Power Overwhelming no longer represents guaranteed damage. Uh, now the, the Emerald Drake comes down, Armor Up puts Aethon to 13, and now Fibonacci actually, I think, will have to kind of get lucky here with his Doomguard not discard that Power Overwhelming. He does have lethal if he's able to Doomguard Power Ysera Awakens this turn, but if Doomguard discards the Power Overwhelming, then he's actually just going to very likely just die on the attack back. That's right? so risky. So you, you obviously have to open with the Sarah Awakens in the, in the way you sequence this. Mm -hmm. And then play the Doom Guard and then just really hope. I mean, you, you're, you're still in a reasonable position here. I believe, what, there's six cards? So it's a one in, only one in three to discard. It looks like it's still up. Oh, there it is. You yeah. got it. Yeah, so discards the right cards. Power Overwhelming off that Dark Peddler is going to close up the first game. And Fibonacci takes a 1-0 lead over Aethon. Yeah, absolutely great. Well played by him, well navigated. And we talked about the fact that the Warlock continues to life tap, continues to get cards, continues to have resources, and then unfortunately at the end of the day, the Warrior just really can't keep up, and we never saw a Brawl from Aethan, and you know, it seems unlikely that he's not at least running one copy of it, but that could have made absolutely all the difference, although to Fibonacci's credit, he never really played into it. I was going to say, most of the time Fibonacci had an individual large threat in the board at any given time, right. and in fact, at, at many points, uh, Aethon, or at least toward the end of the game, Aethon actually had a significant board as well. So Brawl really never would have, I think, swung that game back in Aethon's favor. I think that a lot of that uh, was just a lot of the value and the tempo, in fact, that Fibonacci got off of his faceless manipulator right. on the opposing Ysera as well. No, I think Fibonacci was very calculated in that game. The entire time, he he's obviously very aware of the Control Warrior. Right. If anybody knows how to play against the Control <laughs> Warrior, it's the guy who plays the Control Warrior the best. So he was, I'm sure, always very aware not to play into Brawl, you know, don't overextend too much, and hey, it ended up working out for him. I was going to say, somewhere Kit Kats is very hurt that you said that, but uh, yeah, I completely agree. And you know, for Fibonacci now, has to win with that mage, has to win with that druid, and I uh, have to agree with you, I absolutely believe this is Freeze Mage. And Fibonacci, you know, this Warlock deck he brought, it wasn't really, it didn't fit into any of the modern archetypes we're kind of used to. Like, it was just kind of a handlock, it was what you said, just kind of this control Warlock. Faceless Manipulator appears to have been there to deal with big threats. One, uh, we actually saw him draw a, a Molten Giant toward the end of the game, but we never saw him deal, uh, draw a Mountain Giant. So it's, I, I'm curious to see exactly what the sort of uh, build that he has. We won't see it again in this match because he did just win, right. uh, but throughout the rest of the weekend. And that's, that's one of the interesting things about Warlock, both as a class in general, because there's so many different ways you can build Warlock. Uh, but even, even within an archetype of Warlock, there's so many individual card choices that can really influence how certain matchups play out. Right, and I do want to point that out. We actually featured uh, Fibonacci on the Harson website because he did finish number one for December. And, you know, one of the things that we really learned about him, and it's in that blog, if you get a chance to check it out, is that he is an innovative deck builder. He, a lot of players kind of just, they go, they find this list, they, they build it up, they just start playing it on ladder, and they really don't do too much uh, iteration on it. Whereas Fibonacci is all about iteration. We've oh, yeah. seen cards like Tournament Medic, these these kind of weird cards that a lot of people are just like, no, this isn't good. But his, his number one... Uh Control Warrior deck from the, the December season, not only had Tournament Medic, but it had Deathwing. Right. It had all these like really interesting cards. And that's not a card you put in your deck by accident. That's I mean, maybe yeah, it is. Maybe just maybe just like <laughs> click the most expensive card in the game. But no, usually like, if you end up with a Death Ring and your Tournament Medic in your deck, it's because you've thought things through quite a bit. Like sometimes it's like three in the morning, you're just like going through your collection, you hit seven <laughs> plus, and you're just kinda looking at it. Yeah. Eh, it's a big dragon, I like mean, just that's what happens to me. Right. <laughs> I had to search dragon and I click them all. Drag. <laughs> Just get them all. But it's not even one tournament medic. It's two. So he right. had to at least click it twice. All right. Well, yeah. Athan does choose to go with his warrior deck once again, while Fibonacci is playing what looks to be a fairly typical uh, druid deck. So may maybe not uh, the most exciting tweaks in this one, but we'll see. I was going to say, Druid doesn't necessarily get around to too much of those uh, iterations. It's like, wow, Savador's pretty good. Force of Nature's pretty good. Like, I guess I'll just kill my opponent. Could be Egg Druid. That's it's 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 not. We can see this hand, but right. it could be. We, we don't know that he doesn't have an egg in there somewhere. Like, our dreams haven't been scrambled just yet, Brian. Oh, I no. see what you did there. Well, you know, I didn't, uh, Dan pointed this out to me. I did not get enough chance, uh, enough opportunities to make egg jokes last week for Yambre. So I've been, like, sitting on all these on for social media. I'm like, eh, scrambled, executed, but uh, I promise <laughs> that's the last one. And uh, Fibonacci, as you said, kind of has that, uh, you know, the standard Druid opener. And this is a matchup that doesn't typically favor the Warrior. And we actually see that Ethan has put in Harrison Jones, which is a tech card. You know, it's super solid against Paladins, super solid against Hunters, great against Warriors. Uh, but Druid, you know, obviously it's just a 5-4 for 5, so 
Uh, how do you suspect Aethan has to navigate this matchup to win it, Cora? Fibonacci is definitely favored in this matchup, but Aethan's hand is actually really nice. I really like the piloted shredder uh, on four instead of the death bite here. It's going to allow him to, do, to curve out really nicely. And if he's able to keep board advantage and build up enough armor that the combo just can't actually kill him, then he might actually have a chance. Yeah, I think that one of the ways that Control Warrior can beat mid-range Druid is actually just be by being proactive. It's right. one of the reasons that Patron Warrior typically is actually uh, a deck that has a fairly strong matchup against Druid, because they're able to put them uh, on pr uh, a clock with pressure, backed up by those weapons that they can use as removal plus damage plus tempo. Uh, so here, I, I really like this, you know, Shredder potentially into Sludge Belcher. Uh, that was a little unfortunate mm -hmm. for Aethan. He didn't want to see a 3-2 come out of that. He's going to just trade in. Never actually seen the golden Ooh. animation on that card, but that, uh, that card is pretty bad manners looking. He's just sitting there, <laughs> and, uh, you know, just ready to go, but just quickly dies. And the Whirling Zapomatic, now that could possibly be a game changer, kind of what you said, Brian, to being proactive. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a card that forces Fibonacci to react this turn. Generally, the Druid wants to be in the position where they are asking the questions and forcing the Warrior deck to have the answers. In this position, Aethon has a, you know, effectively a six-power minion in play uh, if it is allowed to go face, and I think that Fibonacci has to respect that with his Keeper of the Grove. No, Fibonacci actually has a very reactive hand. He's definitely equipped to deal with this, and with the Innervate coin, had eight mana that turn, but couldn't quite Azure Drake swipe to actually clear off the Sludge Belcher as well as the zap matic but that Keeper of the Grove does a nice job. We see he actually Fibonacci could have last turn just innervated out that ancient lore, draw some more cards, get closer to finding that combo. It's gonna help him close out the game. And I do not believe with Aethan we saw just a card true heart, which is one of those cards that can swing the matchup in the favor of the warrior. Just finally heal yourself out of range of the combo. But if Aethan's not running that, this uh this could definitely with the amount of cards Fibonacci has be a real dicey game. I have to imagine it's in there somewhere. It's, that's a card that that has been a, a huge uh, player in I think a kind of the resurgence of Control Warrior as a popular deck allowing it to just eventually get out of range of, of things like the Force of Nature Savage or combo by accumulating so much armor. Uh, Armorsmith's actually a card, speaking of armor, that, that's kind of fallen out of, uh, out of favor a little bit uh, because more aggressive decks tend to actually not have so many 2-1 minions. Uh, you know, we don't see so many Leper Gnomes and Worgen Infiltrators anymore. There's more, you know, Tunnel Trogs and, and uh, Flame Imps as far as the aggressive creatures are concerned. So it doesn't trade quite as well as it used to, but uh, Ethan does have a copy of it in his hand right now. This is kind of interesting. Now, we see the second Keeper of the Grove come down from Fibonacci, and, you know, obviously, Aethan has to assume that's it on Silent, so uh, if Sylvanas comes down, Sylvanas could actually get a lot of value, especially because we have not seen that Shade of Max Remus come out just yet. Uh, Cora, what do you like here? Um, I, this Shade is scary. I know, especially as the Control Warrior, you don't want to see that getting big. You have that removal in your hand, but in stealth, you can't do anything about it. I do really like the Dr. Boom on turn seven. Everybody does. It's hard not to like Dr. Boom really? on turn Why? seven. Oh, you know, I mean, it's seven, seven body. It's like a war goal. Like, like, that's just a, pretty good. He's got a medical degree. I mean, why wouldn't you hang out with a doctor? It's one of those things where, you know, it'd probably take you to a nice dinner. He's probably got the money for it. He's, he's got to trust the Dr. Boom. Uh, but Fibonacci is able to keep up with those cards. And like we said in the last match, Fibonacci just kept drawing cards. That Warlock really just built up a huge hand. And with that Ancient of Lore, he's able to do the same thing in this matchup. It, we, we do see the second copy of Pilot Shredder drawn for Aethon here, which is, you know, an interesting choice. We, it's a card that you don't see that much of in Control Warrior at all, really, let alone two mm -hmm. copies. Um, so I'm curious where the room for that came from. Uh, if you are playing a deck that tends to be more uh, more mid-range focused, a card like Brawl is one that you may actually end up either either cutting down on, playing only one, or even playing zero copies. Uh, and that could be a, 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 a difficult uh a difficult card to win without against something like that Shade. We haven't seen Shield Block, we haven't seen Slam or Bash That's actually true, yeah. at this point. So the Piloted Shredders definitely help against the Druid. Maybe he was specifically teching for that, but seems like he's lost out on a little bit of the uh, aggro matchup. I kind of like this. This is Aethan living on a prayer here that he could uh, that he could have hit both Boombots into the Shade because uh, you know he gets one and it does half damage, but that Shade is still ready to go, ready to just mess up his day. And uh, for Aethan, he's just in this terrible place where he has to kind of, you know, dig for that Sylvanas, find some way to deal with that Shade, because aside from that, or maybe Brawl, it's kind of all he has. I think Fibonacci uh, just tried to big game Hunter himself, <laughs> uh, which, you know, obviously that's just not allowed. We, it, we don't have that. It has stealth, so you can't target it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Ethan would have taken that charity big game Hunter on the Shade. He was like, no, no, don't. It's fine. I don't need that. I'll just beat you the old fashioned way. Speaking uh, of, you know, things that are kind of old fashioned now, the Shade finally comes out. And this is this is an age-old uh, argument since Shade of Naxxramas first came out, is when do you reveal the Shade? 
And the conventional wisdom is either as you're winning the game or when you feel it's safe enough and uh, immune to immediately being removed. And Fibonacci's seen an execute. You know, he's got the big taunt wall up. So now it's just time for Shade to go to work. Yeah, he also has a managed to remove all of Aethon's armor. So something like a shield slam, which you actually see in Aethon's hand, currently he has no way to enable that to actually remove the Shade. So Aethon's in a really rough position here. The, the piloted Shredder, great early in the game when it's able to get some pressure on. Not so good here when your opponent is the one who has the edge. No, and you can see just how quickly this game does swing in the favor of the Druid. Aethon was pushing for the board the entire time. He had that Shredder, he had that Sludge Belcher early to really keep tempo. And Fibonacci with one turn was just able to bring it entirely back into his favor. I mean, a lot of this really came down, I mean, we look at how many more resources Fibonacci has currently than Aethon. Kind of similar, like we were saying, to, uh, to the last game. Where uh, where we saw the the warlock get, out, get ahead, ahead in cards pretty uh, pretty massively, and now the ancient of lores that Fibonacci has played, you know, leaving him with this huge hand. While Aethon is down to just one card, and he's actually in combo range. I was gonna say we saw when Aethon made that play, like that was that was a play that cleared the board. But he shook his head. He knew he was sitting at 14 health. Druids on nine mana, and having that many cards, uh, this is my ladder nightmare. Just every single time I came, <laughs> like there's no way he doesn't have combo. And, Oh man, if Fibonacci just goes Force of Nature now and just like, yeah, I'm just going to Force of Nature him again next turn, put some minions on the board, I'd be very surprised. It does not seem like Fibonacci at all, and obviously he does not have Savage Roar in hand. No, but he can just go ahead and play that Shredder, coin out the Force of Nature, clear away that Baron Geddon, and Aethan has nothing to respond to it. Yeah, just that 4-3 uh, that and this, you know, uh, Pilot of Shredder is one of those minions that has really helped Druid in the win condition of just sticking on the board. You know, we, we kind of saw a little bit of iteration when Goblins versus Gnomes first came out, you know, people were running Harvest Golem. Because again, it was just a sticky minion. Even if it dies, it still has Sam Jordan. That is a timely draw. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was an excellent draw from Aethon there with the shield minion. He's still gonna die if there's a Savage Roar uh, <laughs> coming out here because of that additional minion in play, I believe. Well, Aethon did know that as of last turn, Fibonacci did not have the combo. Yeah. But now we see Fibonacci doing one of the famous druid things of spend your wild growth you didn't get in your opening hand. Let's let's find that Savage Roar. Like, obviously, Aethon doesn't know what exactly Fibonacci is looking for, like what pieces. This is the tried and, and true method of Druid. This is really one of the reasons that the, the Druid deck is so strong against Control Warrior, because it, you're able to continue to just play all these threats of the board, so many of which actually just replace themselves, like the Azure Drake, like Ancient of Lore. And if you're able to stick pretty much anything in, in the sort of mid to late game, and you do happen to have Force of Nature Savage, or your opponent's just dead in the spot. No, and he went for the good old Shredder into Shredder, trying to find and that Doomsayer, and Fibonacci's just going to take this game. Yeah, that, that Savage Roar off the top of the deck is going to seal it out for Fibonacci, who takes a quick 2-0 lead over Aethon. Yeah, and unfortunately for Aethon, you know, letting that Captain's Parrot drive a Shredder might not necessarily have been the, <laughs> the best choice. <laughs> the best uh, probably would have wanted something with, with Taunt, maybe. But yeah, it, that's, that's a very difficult matchup, and I really can't stress that enough for the Warrior player to try to win in that situation, because unless you get like an early Jeskar Trueheart, I'm talking like coin on five early Jeskar Trueheart, just so much armor, like Gorehal used to help the matchup like way back in the day, because you could deal with things like Grid of the Claw, but a uh, very difficult matchup, and Fibonacci played that really well, ends up going up 2-0 in this. We, we also saw you know, uh, Aethon d did have that Harrison Jones in his deck, clearly prepared for other matchups, so if that's a card that if it maybe were a, uh, a minion that was a little more resilient, just in terms of stats for its cost, right. could have perhaps changed the dynamic of the early game a bit, Fen Creeper. Three six with Tom. I'm just saying, uh, New the meta. Fen Creeper is upon us. <laughs> no, it was definitely the expected result. I think the Druid is just so favored there. Even though Aethon had a really nice opening hand, it seemed like he was ahead for a good portion of the game, but just couldn't quite get it. Right now, we enter the spot where Fibonacci has to win with one deck, and we we have surmised at this point that it's Freeze Mage. But if you're if you're Aethon, you know if you're you're playing as Freeze Mage, you got that Control Warrior. You're just like. Okay, bring it on, or do you try to maybe get a win with something else since you know that that's kind of a really high percentage matchup for you? Well, there's a couple things to think about. I, I don't believe that the the game win matters at all. This is this is a double right. elimination tournament, yeah. so uh, I, I think that that just playing the deck that is you know you've only you've, well, the only deck he's shown so far is the control warrior deck. It's also the deck that gives him probably the highest chance to win if his opponent is playing freeze mage. Right. So I don't really see any reason to deviate from that because if he plays something else and loses, he's revealed information for really no reason if he does happen to play against someone yep. who's watched the stream uh, later in the day. And uh, you know it's pro it's pretty unlikely you're gonna find a deck that's, that's more likely to just give you the win than control warrior in that matchup. Right. Yeah, Corey, I, you, think, uh, uh, I was gonna say you agree with that. I think just bring out the warrior, get your win, and then if you do you know happen to lose with your next deck. At least you save some information for the loser's bracket from potential opponents. 
Yeah, so going into this, Ethan, you know, down 2-0, and I think one of the most underrated aspects of this as well is just getting a win, just getting a win against somebody. <laughs> Again, you know, Fibonacci, one of those players who maybe not necessarily as well-known as, like, your Strife Crows, your Chalkies, kind of maybe your Raynads as well, but he's one of these players who is really well-known, especially in the community of people who are just constantly grinding on ladders. So getting that win, just feeling a little bit better about your situation, not being down 2-0. That's a really scary place to be, and it's been a long time since I played in a tournament, but uh, when you are down 2-0, as I think I was against like Reels back in the day, those things are just like, I can't win. I suck. I need to retire. I mean, it's, not, it's not even just necessarily this individual matchup either. It's, it's also just going with your mentality for the rest of the day. You know, this, is, this is a long event. You know, even if you do lose this round, you are, you are dropped down to the lower bracket. You have a long road ahead of you to fight back to still try and make it to the top eight. Right, and we see that uh, the tool is very indicative of a Freeze Mage, although uh, Forgotten Torch. This is a card which, uh, when League of Explorers first came out, this was a card where, where people were thinking, okay, you can put one of in this. By the way, there's that Justicar Trueheart. We All finally right. see it. She's been hiding. But well, <laughs> if you're going to draw Justicar Justicar Trueheart, Freeze Mage is, is the <laughs> place to draw this matchup. There basically is not a better matchup for uh, accumulating lots of armor. Cold Whoa. Light Oracle, is this mill? I've seen it before. It's That's not. That's I actually casted a Freeze Mage versus Freeze Mage Mirror the other day. Uh, it might have been a couple weeks ago in TNH, and a Freeze Mage was playing Cold Lights, and I was just like, I, I, I needed to take a minute. So I think the thought process behind Cold Light Oracle is that if you are playing uh, against, <laughs> <laughs> you are playing, I gotta, gotta let that murgle, gurgle, gurgle happen. Oh, it was yeah, also without just, me interrupting him. I was gonna say, it was also just Ethan's faith. Ethan was like, this is no, what? What is this? To me. Uh, but it, it, it ends up, uh, giving your opponent up cards as it gives you cards. So it, it accelerates you to the cards that you need, but doesn't increase your rate of fatigue against an opponent who might also potentially be fatiguing. If, if, if you're both drawing lots of cards, the Cold Blade Oracle will potentially overdraw your opponent. It will, it will uh, not get you deeper into the point where you're going to lose to drawing cards uh, where well, they won't. And it certainly can't make this matchup any worse. <laughs> so there's right. that. Honestly, the inclusion of that to me is just like, I, I just, that's so Fibonacci. <laughs> it's just, you know, you can add Freeze Mage with just your normal Freeze Mage cards, kind of your Freeze Mage starter. But he's like, we need a Cold Light Oracle in here, some Forgotten Torches. Like, probably see like a Jeweled Scarab or something just ridiculous in there. Yeah, if, if I recall correctly from the profile that was actually done on Fibonacci, I believe he played Malagos Freeze Mage yep. uh, as, as his secondary deck to control Warrior when he reached number one legend in December. So a lot of, you know, maybe a little bit unusual card choices on his part uh, throughout his decks. Mm -hmm. We have to sort of wonder, what did the Cold Light Oracles replace? I'm assuming Arcane Intellects, it, it does sort of the same thing, but maybe he just wants a super draw mage. Maybe he's got both. My guess, my guess would probably actually be Acolyte of Pain. Okay. Uh, because I, th I think that you want Arcane Intellect because of the immediacy of the draw mm -hmm. effect, if you do need a specific effect right away. Cold Light Oracle also does that compared to Acolyte. It'll give you, you know, if you need to, you need to find Frost Nova this turn, you lose. You, you'll, you'll be able to just spend your three mana, draw those two cards immediately, rather than have to do it over time with Acolyte of Pain. We see that Fibonacci was not excited to be welcomed to the Grand Tournament. Uh, Just Card Trueheart, obviously, upgrade your basic hero power. Uh, for Warrior, it's Tank Up, which is two mana. You gain four armor. And for Freeze Mage, the win condition is often Alex Straza do a certain amount of damage. Uh, you have a very finite threshold. And this is, you know, if you've never seen this matchup before, this is how the mage just loses. Just being unable to do damage, Alex Straza does not affect armor. Fibonacci, you know, wants to play this one out, wants to get that win. But I, I think, again, this is one of those matchups where if you just played it in day-to-day, uh, ranked play, you'd probably just be like, "Nah, I'm good." I have I have had many opponents concede who are playing Freeze Mage uh, uh, immediately when I played uh, Justicar Trueheart, uh, which is really satisfying because you know <laughs> it, it, it leads me to think that it decreases the chances that they will ever choose to play Freeze Mage again, which is a world <laughs> that makes me happier. I was gonna say, I believe you're opening up a charity <laughs> foundation, Brian Kibler against Freeze Mages, and every donation just slaps a Freeze Mage out of the hand and gives them a Tempo Mage. <laughs> <laughs> That's a world I want to live in. Oh my gosh. I'm all about that Tempo Mage life, so I would also like to live in this world. And uh, Fibonacci living less in a world that he wants to live in. Starting I will to trade you Water Elemental for your Frost Note. <laughs> I would exchange program. That's a. Ryan, you're onto something here. I really like it. And Genius. <laughs> oh, we do see the Malagos coming yeah, in Fibonacci's ooh, interesting. hand. Interesting. All right. And uh, it's, uh, that is a card that can allow you, particularly alongside Emperor Tharison and things like uh, your, uh, your Ice Lances, your Frost Bolts. Uh, could potentially do enough damage to break through huge amounts of armor. So that does perhaps keep Fibonacci in this game. Right, so let's look at a world where, you know, Emperor Thorsen comes down. You get uh, the Ice Lance discounted, you get the Ice Lance discounted. Uh, you get a bunch of Fireballs off Antonidas, and then I guess you play Malagos and just expect it to get Shield Slammed off the board. You're just like, wow, this did not go well. <laughs> well, I, th I think the, the idea is that you 
you know, get your Emperor discount on, say, Malagos, Frostbolt, and Ice Lances. Right. And you could Frostbolt your opponent and perhaps Ice Lance them to no armor so they can't actually, uh, they can't actually either attack it with a weapon and execute it or use a Shield Slam. So, I mean, they could probably just armor up, Shield Slam, execute. But, yeah, this is, we're, we're, we're looking for optimistic, uh, <laughs> right, this an optimistic perspective. One of those matchups where, where you don't begin considering, like, the, the back and forth, like, flow of battle. You're just kind of like, all right, what can Fibonacci do? And uh, interestingly enough, Ethan chooses not to save his Sludge Belcher. Sludge Belcher's like, please, shield slam that Doomsayer. And Ethan's like, nah, you, you've done I, your I job. I don't need you anymore. And you're that's, done. That's, I mean, that's a heads up play from Ethan there. I think that uh, in many cases, people, you know, they're like, oh, I want to save my creatures from, from Doomsayer. But it's actually not really what this this game is about, as we were, uh, as we've sort of been discussing. Uh, this is a game that's about Ethan pretty much just eliminating Fibonacci's ability to win. He doesn't need to do much of anything to actually win himself. He just keeps tanking up. And eventually, for the most part, Fibonacci will just run out of resources to be able to kill him. So his focus is on just survival. Fibonacci has uh, transitioned fully into just hitting him. He's just, mm -hmm. well, I, you know, play Alex Drazen. That's a really heads up play in and of itself because again, the warrior's are gonna heal through armor. That mm -hmm. it helps. So basically anytime you do it and get him down to 15, unless they're just uh, tournament medics, which we have seen from Fibonacci, or something like an antique heal bot, that damage is probably gonna stay there. Mm -hmm. No, and the second that shield baby comes down, he's gaining four health per turn. Fibonacci just has to, I mean, your heart sinks. Like, you've got the chance. You had the Roaring Torches. You've got Malagos. You're saying, okay, I can do this. It has happened before. And it's, it's just becoming less and less likely. You say your heart sinks, but I think Brian's and mine's hearts are respectively, like, rising as the freeze mage Swelling. loses. I, I believe this is known as getting what you deserve. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh... You know, I, I can't really even argue it. It's one of those decks where Freeze Mage is so just infuriating for me to play against that uh, that I I tend to side with the, the you know, or agree with the side of Brian, which is that you should be playing Tempo Mage. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your spirit of fun? I, I mean, I, I definitely recognize that Freeze Mage is a deck that a lot of people do enjoy. Right. But uh, I, I don't. I'm not one of those <laughs> so. people. So. Like, you know what I want to do? Spend 30 minutes in this. I'm like, no, Tempo Mage, man. <laughs> Five minutes are done. Right, so uh, Dr. Boom comes down, continues to present a menacing front for Aethan, and for Fibonacci, it's just kind of one of the things where now he, he's back on that plan of having to try to slow down the board. And we see the heal bot even come out and uh, board freeze, but nothing to really follow it up with. No second Doomsayer. And uh, Fibonacci might be kind of wandering into a place he doesn't want to be. Yeah, Fibonacci has the flame strike. He can remove some of the board, but doesn't want to have to throw any of that really precious burn into the Doctor Boom, especially with Malagos in hand. But until he draws Emperor Thoris on, he's all locked up. Right, we just see that uh, Grom just come out. That's just going to be a removal. And then also just. A giant yelling orc just sitting on the board like, next turn, I'm coming. I mean, he doesn't like being frozen all the time either. He says, I can wait no longer. He's, Come on, <laughs> just just stop all this freezing stuff. Right, and you know, see, Fibonacci's hand, he's got got some burn, and we talked about it. Wow, and that, all right. that is interesting. Now, Fibonacci, you know, 2-1. He still got the series on the next game, but he had the Thor's hand in hand. He had the two Ice Lances. We saw Malagos, and, you know, based on what you said, Brian, he maybe could have started to piece together a win condition, but just decides, like, I don't have enough damage, looks at the math, sees the, the four armor coming up per turn, and just decides I'm done with this one for yeah, now. It's interesting because I actually think that, that he showed some information that he might not necessarily have had to. Uh, for instance, that, that NT Killbot. Right. That's a card that, that may be relevant to the way his opponent plays some of the future games. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that, that he had enough of a chance to actually come back and win that game, right. that it was necessarily really worth uh, showing that information, because that's not really a staple card in the deck. So it's, it's, it's curious to me that, that, that he chose to keep playing at that point uh, and expose that information. Mm -hmm. Aethan saw the Cold Light Oracle. He saw the Forgotten Torches, for mm -hmm. instance, which isn't always in the Freeze Mage. Now, coming into the next games, he sort of knows what to expect. He might even know, for instance, that uh, Fibonacci is running a Malagos. I was going to say, he did conceal that. I think that's the most mm -hmm. important thing, because Malagos right. is one of those cards that, as you said, actually just totally changes the way you play against that deck, because there's a certain damage threshold you're expecting, right? You're like, all right, if he gets me out of 15, you know, I can see Fireball, Fireball Frostbolt, and then I just lose. But Malagos is a complete game changer, and you might even, against the Freeze Mage, think, like, I only need this much removal. I only need to deal with an Archmage Antonidas. I only need to deal with a Thorisand. And then there's a 412 Dragon that makes spells hurt a lot more. <laughs> I mean, the, the turn after you play Emperor Thorisand uh, with Malagos, I believe you can just Frostbolt twice, Ice Lance twice, and do almost 30 damage. Insane <laughs> amounts of damage. I think, I think it's, is it 29? It might be 30. I think about, no, it's 29, I think, with all of those. Hey man, magic, crazy thing, but uh, <laughs> Fibonacci does get the matchup he wants this time. Freeze Mage into Zoo is a matchup that very much favors the Freeze Mage, although certainly winnable for the Zoo player uh, if they do a good job of knowing when to kind of just stop. Well, I guess you, you really never stop going for the face in this one. You're not going to trade to Mad Scientist, so. <laughs> 
It's just kind of, uh, we've seen last weekend, Iron Beak Owl was a huge difference maker in this matchup uh, to Silent to Doomsayer, but, uh, you know, Fibonacci, maybe not necessarily worried about that so much. Yeah, this is also a, a matchup where uh, I think that the Cold Oracle compared to the Accolade of Pain is likely worse because you are allowing your opponent to dig into uh, additional minions that they can threaten you with, get them closer, something like Low Feb, which can have a huge impact on the game. Uh, and the interaction that you get from Accolade of Pain is also actually worth something against Zoo because you know you, they do have all these, these small minions that you potentially attack into. Yeah, the Zulok already has the ability to life tap to really keep up that hand. But eventually, when you've expended all your resources and you're only getting two cards per turn, the smaller minions don't make as much impact. So the Cold Light Oracle sort of just, it gives him even more resources that you don't want the Zoo to have. I was going to say, that make a great just t-shirt. It's just for Zoo. It's like, you give us cards, we'll give you minions. Because that's pretty <laughs> much what Zoo's going to do. And uh, Ethan, interestingly enough, chooses not to play Brand Bronzebeard into Flame and Blaster. Uh, I can't imagine why. Besides, he really wants to be alive. And, and, and that's one of the, the things that the Freeze Mage deck has uh, as an advantage in many cases over the Zoo deck is the fact that it does use its life total as a resource so aggressively. And you often don't even need to Alexstrasza them because they're life tapping and playing things like Flame Imp. Uh, and that, I think, actually uh, makes the Colet Oracle even a bigger issue because if your opponent it doesn't have to be using their life tap because you're just feeding them cards thanks to the Cold Light, uh, they end up not being nearly as close to being in burn range naturally. Yeah, definitely a problem for Fibonacci, especially since he has both Cold Light Oracles in hand. They play well on curve, and it's going to give him more cards. But at this point, I mean, is it even worth it? This is kind of an awkward hand now for Ethan. You know, he drew into a lot of early game threats, which were great. But they don't do a lot of damage, and they're not pushing a lot of pressure. And now we see double Defender of Argus, Doomguard, Soulfire, and Brand Bronzebeard. One thing that's kind of interesting to me is that Ethan actually chose not to play Brand last turn. Yeah. He actually had the mana, and, and rather than play Brand, simply pass the turn. Uh, which is which is particularly curious given that he does have those defenders because doubling the, the effect of, the, of defender uh, is clearly very very powerful. Yeah, probably the strongest thing that you can do with Bran, other than you know abusive sergeants, the occasional dark iron dwarf. We do see the owl come into Athan's hand, which is going to be very useful if we do see the frost nova doomsayer coming from Fibonacci. I've actually Brand Neptalon before, oh. so I mean I assume you just you have <laughs> too like many cards in that Most in your of hand? the time, you actually just end up not having enough room for the cards. <laughs> I actually Brand a, uh, a a Neptalon and got three Finleys once, and I was able to change my hero power so many times. See, that's I get even, to really choose. I was gonna say you're not even trying to win at that point. You're just trying to show your opponent how cool you are. You're like, no, I don't like this one. I'll choose this one. You're just demonstrating your APM. You're like, all right, I'll select this one. Now 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 this one. Rubs, rubs, winding down. You're just busy figuring out like which hat you're gonna wear, basically. I yeah, won. exactly. All right, so Fibonacci in an interesting spot here. Uh, like we said, that Cone of Cold is potentially quite valuable because it does give him the uh, the ability to, to slow things down. Uh, he does choose to attack his Mad Scientist in and then cast Arcane Intellect, uh, which prevents him from potentially drawing the secret that he'd get off Mad Scientist. So good sequencing there. Yeah, very nice. We actually don't usually see the Cone of Cold in the Freeze Mage. That's not kind of interesting. I'm assuming only one, but it used to be very popular. I want to point out, Fibonacci's been mostly just battling for board the whole game. Mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't been necessarily aggressively digging into his deck. We see that Ice Barrier still, it's sitting in his hand. We see the Cold Light Oracle, obviously does not want to give the Zoo player cards, so I like how Fibonacci's approaching this. He's not looking for big flashy board clears necessarily to win him the game. He's just, he's out there fighting the Zoo deck with his Mad Scientist and T-Killbots, and you know, he's had the, the hand to be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is interesting because typically speaking, uh, like you said, the the way that people approach the Freeze Mage versus Zoo matchup is really based around things like Frost Nova Doomsayer, about around Blizzard and Flame Strike. And those uh, those are cards that there are a lot of things that the Zoo deck can do to actually fight back against them. We see, you know, the the uh, egg in play, we see the the creeper, things that easily survive these these burst damage. I'm I, I just keep being confused by Ethan's choice to hold that brand. I wonder if he's just Really banking on some kind of combination of if cards like... If there's a specific thing he really wants to copy with Brand, maybe Lotheb. He can actually lock his opponent out completely if he brands a Lotheb. 
uh, which true. can actually be a really high impact play. Because uh, generally, if you low feb late in the game, your opponent can still play something like an ice block, like a frost nova to lock out your board. Uh, but it, it is it has actually really hindered Aethan's development here in terms of what he's actually getting out of the rest of his resources. Usually, brand defender of Argus is what you want to see come down, especially with these annoying death rattle minions. We do see Doctor Boom come into Aethan's hand though. If he wants to hold the two cards until turn ten, he could end up with four boom bots, which can be really annoying for the mage to have to deal oh, with. Oh yes, and he, uh, it looks like Aethan is considering his his brand now. Probably not into brand Doomguard, but <laughs> <laughs> I would hope not. Like I just, I just don't want any of these cards. They're bothering me. Yeah, maybe something like Bran, uh, Dr. So boom on 10, just impossible. all the boom outs, Bran boom is great. It's, it's, really it's, actually, it's actually really powerful. Uh, you know, we're, we're sort of joking about how it's like maybe a little excessive, but Bran Dr. Boom against Freeze Mage basically makes it almost impossible for them to use any kind of board clears because they just died to death right. The Ice Block can't proc on their turn, so if right. you put a Blizzard or Flame Strike and the Boombots deal, for instance, 16 damage, which yeah. they feasibly could, it, it's all over, and that nothing can feel worse than killing yourself. It's not just feasibly could, it's absolutely will when you do not need them to. <laughs> uh, that's the nature of Boombots, unfortunately. I've spent a lot of time studying up on them, but you know, we see that Brand <laughs> finally comes down and chooses to go ahead and just buff up the Brand himself with the Defender of Argus, as well as that Nerubian Egg. And I was kind of maybe thinking we would see something like Abusive Sergeant come out, like maybe a pair of them. Just get some extra burst damage that the Freeze Mage isn't necessarily accounting for, because the Nerubian Egg probably wasn't going to die. So by sitting it on there, you just had this thing on the board, which very resilient. The Freeze Mage doesn't want to clear, because he doesn't want it to turn into a 4-4 Egg. But, you know, finally decide that's the time to play it. Okay, so we do see now the Cold Light Oracle come out. Yeah, Fibonacci decides it is Murloc time. And uh, Murloc finds a Blizzard, which will help slow Aethan down. But we, I mean, we see the drawback of that uh, that Cold Light in this particular matchup as it does reload Aethan. And there's that Lotheb. Right. And we, we see the Bran is in play. That actually, if, if Aethan does play that this turn, it would actually just lock Fibonacci out of cards. He does decide to hold it. This isn't necessarily a great window. Uh, but here he gets the Bran. Bran, boom. And uh, the embarrassment of riches, not enough room for boom bots. That's so sad. Right, and if we do see that uh, Doomsayer come down with the Frost Nova, he will not have enough space. Yeah, he this will not is, have enough space is, for the Owl. Well, so this is the thing. A Aethon, yeah, we see a little bit of Grimace there. He does have that Soul Fire in his hand. He could potentially Soul Fire his own minion. Oh, and he goes right there. Oh, yeah, he's, there he, he, sees he does it. keep the Owl. Uh, yeah, one of the Doom Guards goes down. He does get get the, uh, the space, and he owls the Doomsayer right away. So really heads up play. He just, no hesitation, Aethon just clears his own Boombot and hits that. Yeah, right. He did exactly what he had to do. So I'm to point out here, you know, this is one of those situations where Aethon, I do not believe, is actually close to popping this and you know, doesn't life tap. No, understands that he has to keep his HP up. 21 damage against a Freeze Mage who's drawn through a lot of their deck is not a lot of health at all. Yeah, absolutely. And we see Fibonacci does pick up the Emperor there. He actually has a very low, low burn count in his hand. We, we see only the Ice Lance and that Cone of Cold. Nothing that really goes face here. Have we actually even seen a Fireball in Fibonacci's deck? That's a Not good point. We've do. seen Torches. We've Not seen to Torch. Do. I haven't seen him across two games draw a single copy of Fireball yet. I can't imagine that he wouldn't be that playing at least <laughs> one. I mean, Forgotten Torch does technically turn into Fireball, but to rely on that is just so inconsistent. All right, we see Cone of Gold. Are we going to see? No, there's no Ice Lance here. So Bran is just living forever. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of an interesting, uh, it's almost like a Tavern Brawl at this point. Like, you just forever have Bran. Watch all your battle cries just uh, all right, so the, do a bunch. The Silence Doomsayer still soaks up quite a bit of damage. But uh, Aethan cannot break the, the, uh, the block this turn. So it's not clear that it's a great opportunity to use Lotheb. That's usually what you want to do, is get your opponent in a position where you break their ice block. If you do, you know, especially if you're able to double up on your low theft. Ooh, he gets uh, a double okay. discover. One of them is soul fire, the other is... Pretty useless. Not corruption. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could you could kill your opponent's Malagos at the start of his turn. Well, you don't know that Malagos <laughs> is there, so... That's probably not something you're factoring in, and... You know, Ethan is actually in a pretty reasonable spot, yeah. I think. Just look at how many cards he has in his hand. He's, he's a handlock! <laughs> basically, <laughs> he's been fed so many cards by those Cold Light Oracles that he still is able to just sit here with a full hand without ever having to life tap and really, uh, really open himself up to that burst damage from Fibonacci. Yeah, 21 is definitely a reasonable amount of health against a Freeze Mage, but especially looking at Fibonacci's hand, it is really clunky. We see he's got the second Ice Block, two Ice Lances, which will come in really handy, but until you pick up a Frostbolt or something to actually freeze your opponent's hero, not very what useful with the Malagos. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And now, Athan, I believe, there's, he, there's 19 on the opposing side. He has, I think he has, yeah, he's threatening enough damage to just break that ice block next turn. Um, so Fibonacci has to, be, has to be cognizant of that. He could try to ride his ice block, perhaps play Emperor or Alexstrasza, his I opponent, um, this turn. But he, he's not even opening himself up to really getting a burst combo with either of them because his hand is, is, is relatively weak. And if he does something that uh, doesn't oh, actually deal with his opponent's ability to break block this turn, we know there's that Lothab in Aethon's hand with Bran Bronfbeard in play, and that can just lock Fibonacci mm. completely out of the game. Yeah, it's a very awkward position for Fibonacci. He can go ahead and Alex and sort of set up for two-turn lethal, maybe scare Aethon a little bit, but he, we know, especially after using one Ice Lance, he just doesn't have the damage. Yeah, so Ice Lance does stop Dr. Boom from attacking, which will protect the Ice Block this turn. Uh, I believe, well, ac it's well, it actually not necessarily even clear. And he's got Doom Guard in hand. He could pop block. Yeah, with, with uh, he could pop block, but that risks Lothep. Because mm -hmm. I'm wondering if he can actually pop Ice Block and still Lothep this turn, which I think he might be able to do. If he if he power overwhelmings one of his minions, uh, because, uh, yeah, yeah. then plays Lothep Soulfire you. That would do it. Yeah, this will pop Ice Block and leave Fibonacci unable to play spells because his, uh, the, the double effect from Bran on the Lothep. Yeah, here we go. And we see Aethon going with exactly that sequence. Lothep into Soulfire. I don't think there's anything Fibonacci can do here. No, especially once that Alex Straza comes down. Now, yeah. it's worth noting that even if the Alex Straza had come down, Aethon has such a board at this point that 15 health was basically nothing. But yeah, this really does just lock him out of winning. Yeah, now spells are uncastable. They all cost 10 additional. None of the minions do anything to stop this lethal incoming from Aethon. I think Fibonacci's dead. Yeah, Aethon's just going to take this one and tie up the series after going down 2-0. Uh, we see, we see Fibonacci just kind of shaking his head, looking at his hand here. Do I play the 13 mana ice block? <laughs> mm. I was going to say, that 17 mana flame strike doesn't have I a lot of value. Should, I think he should coin flame strike this turn. I like that. <laughs> coin is a spell he could cast, to be fair. The 10 mana. And there it is. <laughs> Fibonacci concedes, and Aethon picks up what has to be a, a, a great win there. <laughs> yeah, he starts with the peace signs. He's like, I did it. I'm doing it. I mean, that that is that is a matchup where the Freeze Mage deck is typically very favored. Right. Uh, we did see some of the specific card choices from Fibonacci, I think, come back to haunt him there. The, the Cold Light Oracles really helped Aethon uh, keep totally gassed up, find his key cards like that Lotheb, right. uh, despite never really having to life tap. I was going to say, we earlier were like, yes, innovation, cool. Bring all these cool cards to your deck. Wait, now it's a no. time to, now it's a time we're like, eh, maybe, a less innovation. maybe things are that Ooh, way Speaking of innovation, this looks like it might not be a secret Paladin deck. I'm offended, <laughs> personally offended. I'm, no, okay, this actually doesn't surprise me too much. Brian, go back to the America's Championship. Yeah. When we saw uh, Molagel in Korea, they brought mid-range Paladin. It's true. That is true, yeah. The uh, uh, Latin American players, ha at least last year, did typically show us uh, that they were very, very uh, in favor of Midrange Paladin compared to the Secret Paladin deck. And Aethon has some of the pretty important cards. You know, Midrange Paladin versus uh, Freeze Mage, typically a matchup much like uh, the, the Zoo versus Freeze Mage that favors pretty heavily the Freeze Mage player. Uh, but Lothep and Antique Hailbot that Aethon keeps very, uh, very intelligently in his opening hand uh, those are some cards that can definitely turn things around. Meanwhile, Harrison desperately wants something, anything to put in a museum Aww. in this series. Hey, come on. Poor guy. No luck. Might just take one of uh, Ethan's own weapons. Oh, we see that true silver come out, but yeah, the Tempo Alder Peacekeeper. That is not a play you see all that <laughs> often, but against Freeze Mage feels pretty good. Yeah, I mean, Freeze Mage doesn't really have anything that you're looking to uh, looking to re uh, oh, reduce the power of, at least not early in the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can put the Doomsayer to one attack. Mm -hmm. You can. That's something. Yeah, um, and then it will kill your own guys. There you go. No, but even if Aethon has, we're assuming he's got an Aryan Big Owl, potentially a lay on hands. This this could be uh, a matchup that he certainly has the potential to win. Yeah, the biggest problem for the mid range Paladin player against Freeze Mage is that they don't really put on that much pressure, and, and it gives the Freeze Mage player a lot of time to assemble everything that they need. Even if you do have heals and uh, and disruption like Lothab you can often suffer from the fact that you're just not really putting your opponent on a significant clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am, think that the very likely, huh, we're actually, I was gonna say, we're, we, we might likely see a Frost of a Doomsday here, but we do not. We do see just Forgotten Torch and Ping on that shield. Yeah, Fibonacci probably just setting up for a Blizzard next turn. Not too worried about it, like you said. There's just not a lot of pressure coming it's from true. the mid-range Paladin. 
Yeah, he also lacks the card draw, obviously the Warlock has, though. So. Right. Uh, as a mid-range Paladin player for, for most of GBG, this is a matchup That's where uh, you can win it. Certainly, the stickiness of the board helps. Having that uh, shielded minibot, having a bunch of minions come down when the freeze range player doesn't necessarily have the correct response is great, but if you're not drawing a lot of cards, and yeah, things suddenly get really bad really quickly for you, and uh, Quartermaster, one of those cards where was very popular for a long time in GBG, Helps make this incredibly high pressure board, but you know, it's it's not so much in Secret Paladins these days, although there was a point where we were seeing like one ofs in that deck. And yeah, we see Fibonacci still just being very, very patient, and we see that he's still he's still at 31 life. He he got healed by that zombie chow and it died. His ice barrier gave him some armor, and despite the fact that Aethon has just been attacking his face every turn, uh, the, the game has really not progressed very much in terms of life totals. Let no, we see these think. boards developing, especially from Aethon, but 30 health for Aethon, 31 for Fibonacci. It's it's going to be a longer game, <laughs> for sure. Right, and we did see, you know, when Aethon was playing Zoo, he wasn't trading into those kind of, like, smaller minions, the loot hoarders, the mad scientists. He was just kind of going face, and this has been just a complete reversal now. He's been pretty much trading with everything that comes down as the Paladin Let player. And, uh, Brian, any insight as to why that might be, the, the change-up in policy? You're, you want to protect your life total so that, that you're not really uh, you know, at risk of just kind of exposing yourself to burn without that Alexstrasza. I think that in general, you, you want to, to keep, uh, keep things clear. Yeah, and especially now that Aethon has seen this Freeze Mage deck twice, he, he's got a lot of information about it, knows that it's running the Cold Light Oracles, and maybe Fibonacci's just a little bit more uh, willing to do minion damage, to actually play more minions. So he's, he's thinking, I'm going to trade these away, just be really, really safe about it at this point. If you are Aethon, I wonder how comfortable you feel. Because as you said, you play this deck twice now. You feel like you know the ins and the outs of it, but you haven't seen Malagos yet. So this continues to be an ace in uh, Fibonacci's sleeve. Yeah. And uh, Aethon with the Dr. Boom on seven, he, uh, he now has a really scary board. He's, he's gone from, you know, having, okay, I have a little bit of, you know, small damage here, small damage here. I think we're going to see Fibonacci uh, pull the trigger on one of those big removal effects. Blizzard takes out everything but Harrison and the Dr. Boom. Dr. Boom gets pinged, setting up a possible flame strike mm -hmm. for the next turn to answer what, uh, ooh. Ooh, that's a tough I was gonna say to answer, <laughs> I was gonna say to answer whatever <laughs> Aethon plays, but it does not answer the, uh, the Tyrion Fordring. Right, and the reason why this is so impactful is, you know, Fibonacci has the ability to flame strike, but, oh no, he actually could have pinged too, so wouldn't have killed Tyrion, but it would have done a, a significant turn. Frost the, the Doomsayer from Fibonacci now, uh, finally does pull the trigger on it. Aethon without any sort of silence effect. And uh, but this is one of the one of the things that that is the problem for the Paladin deck against Freeze Mage. They don't have access to things like Keeper of the Grove that Druid does. Mm -hmm. Typically, maybe play one Owl, but don't really have much of a card draw to find it. So often you just find yourself in a position where you can't stop that Doomsayer, and that's exactly what happens. And now like suddenly, tables are turning. Fibonacci sets Aethon to 15. Uh, with the Alexstrasza. Thankfully, the, the Healbot is there, and this is yep. not something that was at all not an inclusion for mid-range Paladin during the tenure of this deck's power. So, uh, for Ethan, the, it's actually really great. You just swung the, the board, you got the Dragon off the board, you've got Big Game Hunter, you've got the Healbot. Your health is back up to a comfortable 23. The only thing I want to point out that it is maybe not going his way is, and this is why I took one quarter master out of my mid-range Paladin deck, is this is a card that sits in your hand. It's when it's great, it's great, and when it's not, it just sits in your hand. And I kind of wonder oh, if maybe it might be great. And soon. now it's great. <laughs> well, no. Now, do you give up your Ashbury? It's 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 a tough spot, mm. but I, I think double that Belcher this turn. I I actually kind of yeah. I, this turn I like attacking uh, and just playing both Belchers. Your opponent has just Flame Strike. Belcher is pretty resilient to a lot of their removal effects. Right. So, uh, and you're also just putting your opponent on a clock where you are with both Belchers just threatening to break block next turn anyway, thanks to the Ashbringer swing. So, uh, Quartermaster is still not the play I would make, but uh, it's not looking nearly as, as awkward thanks right. to that muster draw. Yeah, slightly better. And like you were saying, uh, the Paladin, very similar to the Zoo in that it is it is a board control deck. It's all about minion damage. And not being able to get rid of these Doomsayers, I think we're going to see another one come down right now, is definitely hurting him. But uh, a little bit of a clunky hand, but the Quartermasters could actually make quite a dent in Fibonacci's health. Yeah, Fibonacci obviously sitting on some damage, but that heal has just really messed him up. And that True Silver, mm -hmm. speaking of heals, that's a nice draw from Aethon there. It, it does give him a little bit more ability to, to eke out of range of burn from Fibonacci, uh, who really hasn't been able to assemble very much. I, I'd like to reiterate, in, in now in three games, we've yet to see a fireball from Fibonacci. I like that Aethon. Aethon this turn decides not to make a 
a token before the the doomsayer goes playing around dragon's breath uh Ooh, for sure i was very I, whenever i see paladin players i'm like why you're just sending them to his death like he he probably has a family or something. It actually, it, it is. I think in general, it's strictly correct not to do it because you, it does play around Dragon's Breath to some capacity. It's not. It's almost never going to come up. It's also the right thing to do, Brian. <laughs> That's what matters here is the, the moral questions of Hearthstone. Don't put that poor recruit in harm's way. Thank what did he ever do to you? Thank you, Corey. You, you get it. <laughs> uh, Fibonacci does have two Ice Lances. He has the Roaring Torch. He has Emperor Thorosan, but I kind of feel like he needs a Frostbolt now to just string this all together. And again... He's that true silver champion, as you brought up, four health over two turns might not seem like the end of the world, but it might actually just be the end of Fibonacci. It's, it's not even not even just necessarily the the health too. It, it also pressures Fibonacci's life total uh, that can't be frozen by something like Frost Nova, like Blizzard. And here, Fibonacci uses a Frost Nova to stop two wow. slimes because that true silver threatens to break his ice block. Oh, oh. That keeper's a great draw. It is. It, it it will allow him to take out if he chooses the the Emperor. Uh, both without taking quite as much damage to his face. Uh, otherwise, he actually wouldn't have a way to kill it without those slimes. Mm -hmm. Right, and obviously Keeper of Oldman, one of those uh, Oldman. <laughs> I've never been able to pronounce what? that dungeon correctly. Oldman. I call her Kappa of Oldman. No, okay. Kappa of Oldman. Way to, way to be in touch with the kids there, Brian. Yeah. Uh, don't <laughs> let your age hold you back. But, you know, uh, it's certainly made a difference in pretty much every Paladin deck we've seen since it's come out in League of Explorers. It's just one of those cards that's super versatile can be used to buff one of your minions, can obviously decrease the value of an enemy minion. So as much as uh, Aethan may be kind of living in this pa in the past with this mid-range Paladin deck, he's like, I guess Keeper of Old Mount's pretty good. All right, Coldblade Oracle. And this was, we were sort of talking a little bit about what Coldblade Oracle does uh, compared to the uh, the Acolyte in terms of the upside. And here we see Fibonacci able to get those two cards immediately, and that may actually help him string together the damage he needs. But Aethon does have Lothab waiting in the wings uh, to close out any kind of individual big turn that Fibonacci might be hoping to have. Fibonacci does a great job every single time he, he goes to telegraph that he's doing damage. What he just like do? points at the face for a second. He's like, I'm really considering just killing you. Like, I really would like to win this game. <laughs> Aethon can never feel safe. Yeah, he, he actually plays the, uh, the, the torch first because he wants to potentially get the other torch into his hand. Uh, and now Aethon, I think, is probably going to try and go for break your block, play Lothab. That does, thanks to the Emperor uh, reduction on, the, on the, the Ice Block, allow him to potentially play Ice Block and uh, actually nothing else, unfortunately. Yeah. But a ping. Yeah, Aethon just going to go ahead and break this block here, set up the Lothab, likely going to not completely shut out Fibonacci's next turn, but make him really difficult for him to win. He doesn't have Malagos in hand for the first time in three games. <laughs> we actually, I believe, let's, I'm looking at the damage potential in Fibonacci's hand. He has. Frostbolt, two Ice Lances, so that's that's 11 damage, plus the Roaring Torch at 17. With a ping over two turns, he actually has lethal in two in turns. Two turns. He, he, he can play Ice Block, ping the opponent, and if there's no more life game out of A-Fan, or some way to possibly deal with the Ice Block, I think Fibonacci may have the tools to close this out. So unless Aethon can pick up something like uh, an Antique Heal Bot, a Lay on Hands, or a Secret Kazan Mystic Tech, it mm -hmm. looks like Fibonacci is going to actually have two-turn lethal. Yeah, and, and that second Roaring Church definitely makes it a lot easier as well. Uh, adds a bit to his damage potential. That that I actually think may, because those Ice Lances are both zero. So yeah, he can actually play all of those next turn. I don't think there's a way for, for uh, Ethan to get out of this. He has no way to close this out. And it's exactly what we were talking about in terms of the time that Midrange Paladin gives to Freeze Mage to just assemble everything. You know, Ethan has been ahead all game. He had all these tools that he needed, but just didn't quite have the the pressure to actually keep Fibonacci from just assembling, despite everything, this this burst damage lethal. Mm -hmm. The Cold Light Oracles were definitely not as detrimental in this game as they were mm. in the Zoo game, uh, just allowing him to get even more cards in hand even quicker. And those Roaring Torches are really going to come in handy. I like the Forgotten Torch tech a lot. Yeah, I actually think that Cold Light Oracle won him this game. If those were, were anti bot or uh, rather uh, of ac Acolytes of Pain, he would not have had the time to actually find all these cards. Oh, and uh, here it is. So we see just Roar, Roar, Frostbolt, Ice Lance, and that is going to be it. Wow. Fibonacci, he struggled a bit with this Freeze Mage in the first two games, but closes it out here, takes the match over Aethon, three games to two.
right? And that has to feel really good for Fibonacci to go up 2-0, start losing those matches, and then it kind of comes back where he finally manages to close out the series. For Ethan, <laughs> there's almost a sense of like false hope. You're like, I'm doing it. I'm coming. <laughs> um, no, just a lot of magic comes out and you die. <laughs> no, but you know what? Coming back three games to two, it definitely feels a lot better than losing three yeah. games to zero. He's going to go down to the loser's bracket, but he's going to have a little bit more confidence saying, you know what? I almost beat one of the best lighter players that there is. Yeah, I mean, the, the mentality, like we said earlier, it's, it's a long day. And your mental state really does matter. You know, you're in the lower bracket for a lot of matches if you're gonna if you're gonna make it all the way up right. to the top 16, mm -hmm. even the top eight. And uh, if you were to lose 3-0 in your first match, that's a little demoralizing. But being able to come back and uh, and have a close match in the end, I think, uh, will definitely help his his uh, mental state going forward. Right, and obviously we've seen this isn't this isn't the first time we've seen players from South America. They've done a great job in in terms of kind of bringing their own unique style and showing the way they do business. And uh, I think for Ethan, you know, coming out there as you said. Getting mm -hmm. these two wins against Fibonacci, being basically a turn away from just winning the game. I mean, he really was just right there. He had a ton of damage in hand, a bunch of cards. So I think this is a good way for him. And kind of when you're on the stream for the first time and you have, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of players watching you, mm -hmm. you want to you wanna put up that good performance to where, as you said, just continue on, you know, through the lower bracket, try to prove you how what it takes to, you know, eventually get to that top eight and go to the America's Winter Championship next month. No and no apparent misplays from either player. Both players played at a very high level. I think at the end of the day, it just came down to the nature of the mid-range Paladin. You say no misplays, but I'm sure Twitch chat has come up with at least 180. They're going <laughs> to prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm actually a little a little uh, curious about uh, Aethon's ban strategy there. I mean, and, and this is actually, we talked about this a little bit, you know, that, that Fibonacci is known as sort of this legendary, even mythical warrior player. Uh, he was playing a mid-range Paladin deck and did not ban Mage. So I, I wonder if that sort of reputation from Fibonacci kind of got in his head and he didn't necessarily think through the ban strategy in terms of, well, if this is Freeze Mage, I'm just not going to win with mid-range. Paladin. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, it's possible that, that he has some more tech cards in there, the Lothab and the Healbot. Maybe there's some other things we didn't see. Uh, but, you know, it, I think that, that if there was sort of a, a potential error on his part, that may right. have been his downfall. Right, so you've heard what we have to think about that match, but let's throw it over to Dan in the host area and get his thoughts on what we just watched. Thank you very much, Rob and crew. You know, that game and series was pretty nail-biting to the finish. In the very beginning, it looked like Fibonacci was going to run away. 2-0 lead. And then Athan showing that he can come back and showcase his skills. I think that's a really important thing for his confidence level. If you're going to lose in the first round, you might as well take one of the highest-ranked players, or at least the highest-seeded players, uh, to the brink of elimination into the double bracket. So uh, we're going to go ahead and update you guys on what's going to happen here. Uh, first, I'm going to show you guys a little bit of what's happening uh, on the other side of the matches. Uh, Frozen and Death Star, these are two players who are notable high-ranked players uh, for the entire seasons, are in round two. They have advanced. We do have an upset. Uh, Impact has dropped to the lower bracket. He's a notable player that's helped a lot of people build their decks, very much like Amnesiac, who also is advanced to the round two, as well as Fibonacci. Um, Kit Katz is also a notable player, a fellow controller Control Warrior player has also advanced to the round two. So we definitely have some players who are going along through, definitely not as uh, tumultuous as the European bracket. In the first couple of rounds, we had many upsets. In fact, it was often touted as the stream curse. If you were going to be on stream, you were going to lose. Uh, but we do have a player who has broken that curse for now. It is Fibonacci who is joining us on Skype. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Hello. Awesome. Hello. Welcome to the stream. Uh, let's go ahead and let you introduce yourself to anybody who is watching you for the first time. Uh, I'm Fibonacci. Uh, I'm from Canada. Uh, I usually play Warrior. Uh, I've finished uh, rank one multiple times. Um, that's about it. Multiple times is an understatement. In fact, uh, your ladder finishes has given you so much no notoriety that people are demanding you to come to the limelight. They've seen your name so often on streams. You be keep beating the streamers. Uh, you keep beating everybody in terms of the top ranked. Uh, what do you think is the key to your success compared to other people who try to play Control Warrior but are nowhere near as successful as you are? Uh, when, when playing Control Warrior, you have to experiment a lot. Because if you keep using the old like uh, standard builds, I don't think you can go that far because the meta changed every day, so you have to play a lot every day. So if you absorb the meta, then you just have to find a new deck. That way, you can have consistently uh, high win rates, even if the meta is awful warrior. 
Thus saith the Lord. Uh, you know, congratulations on your win. This is the first time that you're really competing in front of the camera, even when you were qualifying last year for the Hearthstone World Championship. We didn't really get to see too much of you outside of a picture. Um, do, do you feel nervous at all? I mean, it seems like your play is still very solid. It doesn't feel like you're making any obvious mistakes. Uh, if you feel like you, you don't like your lines of play, we definitely can't tell. So uh, can you tell me about your mental state? Do you feel very confident going forward from this match? No, I'm, I'm very nervous. This is my first online event. And I think I played all three matches very badly. Um, I don't know, my pre-majors, pre-mage games were like terrible, I think. But uh, hopefully I will show the good games from pre-mage or other decks. I'm very, very nervous right now. Ah, well, that's really scary then. The rest of the bracket should be unnoticed. If this is you still winning while playing what you feel like is really bad, uh, then we have a lot to fear moving on. Uh, congratulations. We don't want to take too much of your time. Do you have any uh, last words that you want to say to the stream before we let you go? Um, uh, I want to thank you, the community, uh, supporting me. Uh, even though I streamed much, uh, I haven't wrote a guide or anything. So it was Nice to hear the positive feedback from the community. So thanks for that. It, congratulations as well. It wasn't really so much as a positive feedback so much. It was a forceful demand. People really just want to know who Fibonacci is. Uh, congratulations on your win again, and hopefully we'll see you again later. See. All right, so there it is, Fibonacci. You know, Fibonacci's username is actually Fibonacci2016. So perhaps that's an indication of what's to come. This could be his year, the year that he breaks out, as well as the year of you guys continue to break out as well. This is entirely a role oriented around the open players. That's what the Hearthstone Championship Tour is all about. So let us know your opinion as well. Engage in the conversation. Hashtag HCT. Tweet us at Play Hearthstone or go to Facebook.com slash Hearthstone. I'm Frodan, and when we come back, we're going to have more matches here. We're just getting underway for the America's Prelim. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.